next session, by the way, is not going to be in this building, just so you remember this. It will be in Fitzgerald Building, which is further along College Street, just before you get to university. But all that information will be in our newsletter, which I assume most of you get, or you will find out about this session. My name is Richard Strand. I'm the director, at least for the year, uh, called the interim director, which somebody said, nonetheless, you're the director, uh, of the city center. Uh, and um, I have the great pleasure, actually, of being able to promote a continuation of a public discussion series, which we started last year. Last year, we called it Toronto in Question. Um, that sounded a little bit ambiguous. Uh, we were asking lots of questions about what Toronto really was and uh, who had what ideas about major issues of the day. It was very successful. Uh, so as a result of that, we decided to continue with uh, the same idea but with a different theme. This year, we're going to talk about governance in Toronto because although it may sound simple, it could be as simple as just a chart on a page, but it's nowhere near that. Uh, Toronto is an enormous city, as most of you know, and you're going to find out more about it. It has a huge number of employees, it has, it covers a very large area, and it's very, very complex, and I'm not sure that everybody who works for it or in it understands it uh, that well. Uh, this year, in the series, which we've called Governance in Toronto, we have a list of sessions, and uh, we, I haven't mentioned here, we, we haven't written exactly who is going to be participating, but our, the uh, frame that we have is that for each session, we have an hour of presentations, and that hour is divided between a, what we call a practitioner and what we call an academic. Somebody who has worked in the system or works with the system, uh, and somebody who writes about the system and does research. And we try to keep these discussions as balanced as possible. Uh, so the first uh, session, which we'll uh, get to very, very shortly, is called Being Mayor in Toronto. And the second session, which is next week, going to be on the October 29th, which is a Monday, and that is in the Fitzgerald Building, which is uh, just before you get, anyway, we'll give you the information. I think it's around 213 College Street West. So anyway, you'll find out where that is very easily. And uh, we had some, one or two sessions there last year. And the third one is, or at least in this uh, semester, or at least in this term, is Toronto and Toronto's Municipal Civil Service. Uh, next week, the two participants are Mike Layton, who is the counselor, who will be talking about uh, his role as a counselor and anything else he wants to say, uh, and um, Andrew Sancton, who is a very well-known academic who writes about local government in Toronto with uh, considerable knowledge and experience. Um, and finally, uh, the, no, November 27th, we have uh, Sita Ramkala, I'm sorry, Sita, Ramkala Waram, and Ramkala Wans Ram Singh, and I'm uh, sorry, my writing is bad, and Sita is going to be the practitioner, she'll talk about the municipal civil service, and the commentator uh, on, her, uh, on her presentation, or, or in general, will be Martin Horak, who is a, an academic from the University of Western Ontario. So that's, we do have a number of other speakers chosen for the second half, but I'll just leave that to you to watch our newsletters and to find out who they are. So these are our sessions for, for this year. Now, uh, the format for today is that we have a moderator, uh, and this is uh, Professor Shauna Gray, who's sitting beside me. Um, and uh, Shauna is a senior lecturer and director of experiential learning at the University of Toronto's Urban Studies Program at Innes College. Her research lies broadly in the field of economic geography, and she 
she looks at also at, at the social, cultural, and economic changes associated with shifting strengths of cities. Um, she also manages uh, uh, the students, I guess, as part of the urban studies program. And uh, she has placed, and this is quite, quite impressive, more than 270 U of T undergraduate students in internships and service learning placements across the city uh, over the time that she's been at in this college. So I'm very happy to welcome Shauna, who will be the moderator for the evening. Thank you.
Richard and the City Center for inviting me and thank Shauna uh, for, for moderating and uh, very much uh, thank uh, the other part of the panel which I'll refer to I'll refer to in, in a minute. Um, you know, when you do these kinds of series, you have to have a mayor at the beginning. And uh, so you sort of take what you can get for that particular, particular night. Um, and I'm speaking about my experience as mayor in Toronto between 94 and 97. So that was Toronto before amalgamation. Uh, it was before social media. Council was 16 plus one. Um, I also ran for mayor in 97 uh, against Mel Lastman to wanting to be the first mayor of the new amalgamated city. And that was a, a great race, and I lost by a bit. But it was a, a close race and an exciting race and taught me a lot more about our city. And then I ran again in uh, 2003 and was obliterated in in that campaign. Um, so I know how big the city is. I know how complex it is. I know that just from elections, that the election for the mayor of Toronto involves a campaign that in, in a geographic area that includes 22 federal or provincial ridings. So if you think about the amount that goes into a provincial or a federal campaign with the party organization and structure behind it, um, then you have to question the sanity of anybody who runs for mayor when they've got 22 ridings of, of that size, no party system, no structure such as as that uh, to, to support you. But I did it the three times and I loved it when Toronto was small and I loved it when Toronto was big and I love uh, every opportunity to talk about the city and, uh, and some of the, my experience as, as mayor. I think in my time, I'm going to talk uh, fairly quickly about a number of the relationships or specific roles that, that the mayor, in my view, um, plays. And then I'm going to talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about the uh, one example, one story from my time as, as mayor. And just, there really aren't any job descriptions or guides about what to do when, um, when you become mayor. There's this massive interview process, the election, where everybody's questioning you or looking at your hairstyle or um, what you're wearing, in the case of women often, um, as they determine who to hire or elect to, to the job. When I was elected, I'd been on council for, for nine years as a city councillor. And I really ran for mayor because the opportunity that I might be able to be elected emerged. It really is as simple as that. It seemed possible 
that, that I could run. And I made the decision to ultimately run, something I had never really had any ambition to, to do. Because of the, of the possibility to be in that role and influence the city, but more than that, to influence urban issues and a range of issues right across the country. Because in fact, as mayor of the city of Toronto, one has the capacity to do that. And my husband, Max, who for a long time had been head of social planning for the city of, of Vancouver, and together we shared a passion for cities across our country and many issues related to cities, we really made the decision that having that opportunity wasn't something you walked away from. And so we, I guess I, or in some ways we together made the decision that, that I would, would run. When we think of mayor, I guess we think first of all about the role of mayor in relation to to city council. And when I was elected mayor, I was elected without majority support on city council. Council was 16, and uh, I was about a vote short. So I came to the position, the first council meeting was the um, electing of the membership of committees and chairs for them and the person who some would describe as my arch rival Tom Jakovic um, was able to be uh, elected budget chief at, at that first uh, meeting. I in fact supported him when I knew he was had the votes to take that position because um, if he was going to be there, then I was going to find ways to work with him in that role as opposed to being the opposition to one of the major um, committees. I saw the role as mayor vis-a-vis -vis council as being really about conducting a group sort of an orchestra as opposed to being a one-woman band. Um, I often sat as I <coughs> chaired council, and I'm a patient person. Um, I used to think perhaps a career in child care would be good. <laughs> Kindergarten teacher. I mean, at times it felt like that. But I was patient and I did listen to people and look for opportunities to draw out agreement and as a goal to building consensus. So I started with a council with the, where I didn't have uh, enough support guaranteed support to, to deal with things. And yet, if you look at the numbers over the term, the vast majority of items that came to council, I had support of a majority. So I worked with each member of council, assuming that each of them had run in order to achieve something and wanted to understand what their goals were in order to find some commonality and some way to, to build trust, respect, and uh, some collegiality, and was able to, to do that. And I think over the term of council, I was able to develop uh, confidence from my, my colleagues. I often settled arguments. Um, and really looked for opportunities to seize. I often talked about the fact that we were all in this together and it was better for us to work together than to, to
to fight. And uh, we were able to achieve a lot through that relationship with, uh, with council. And when I ran in 207, many of the councillors who had not supported me when I ran in 204 supported me in, in 2007. We weren't necessarily from similar political perspectives, but i have been able to build a good relationship with them. And they knew we'd been able to make things happen together, and they, they supported me again. Another important group that the mayor has the responsibility to work with is staff. And I must say at the city we had fantastic staff. And I knew that staff could make or break you. That they knew many more of the secrets about that building, about how things happen, about how to make things happen, than I could ever know. And they were going to be supportive, or they could undermine and make implementation and progress impossible. It was a tough time financially in 94. Uh, the R word, the recession word, was out there. In fact, over the time um, that, that I was mayor, we significantly reduced the bureaucracy at the city. We went through a very painful process of, of streamlining. But I believe we were able to do that and maintain a high level of morale uh, by communicating and respecting the staff at, at the city. Um, I still run into people from senior management, or not so senior management, I guess, many years, years later, who recall, re recite back to me a story I told them at one of the meetings of senior staff, where I talked about what I did when I was dealing with anxiety myself. And I live in a house in Cabbage Town that I lived in then as well, and it had been a rooming house at one point. And for years, when I felt uh, financially vulnerable, enough so that I lay awake at night, I used to think about my house, and if I had to rent it out, parts of it out and revert it to a rooming house, which room i pick and move into. And that when I figured that out and what I keep and what I couldn't and keep it up, then, um, then I felt comfortable because I understood um, the, the, that ultimately I would be okay through this. Through this. And uh, I told that to staff and that I understood the anxiety and that all the change would be done in a respectful way and we were supportive and encouraged people to take to take risks and didn't throw them under the bus if those those risks ended up uh, in in failure understanding that in order to be creative and out of the box you're going to experience that and uh, so during a difficult time of reorganization and some death downsizing, was able to keep a motivated, creative staff at the city, and I think that's a role of the, of the mayor. So the mayor is the only one on council elected by all the, the, the people. The um, several hundred thousand people. Um, when Mel and I ran against each other in 2007 and, and both got in the high 300,000 number of votes, Max, my husband, used to say it should be a trivia question in Trivial Pursuit as to who in the history of Canada has re received the most votes. 
votes. And at that point, it was male and me second. And if, we, if you ask people that, they'd say, I don't know, Trudeau, Mulroney, whatever. All of those folks run in a riding, but we ran throughout the city. And by virtue of that, really what the mayor is the only one who speaks for the, for the whole city, for a big demographically diverse city. And to be in that speech and messaging inclusive of diverse, all the diverse communities, be it economically diverse, diverse in terms of creed, color, political ideologies. The mayor has a job to support and encourage the people of the city and to make them in some sense feel that this is their city and they're valued as, as a part of, of that. And so that's in terms of communications, it's reaching out. Um, I remember at the time some, I think it was a Sun columnist who accused me of being willing to go to the opening of an envelope in, in Toronto. Uh, I don't think I ever went to an opening of an envelope, but I sure <laughs> went to a lot of openings, and I still have friends who, whenever they do anything new in their house, a new dock at the cottage, renovate, the, they invite me to come and cut the ribbon, because <laughs> that's something I really know how, how to do. And during the three years as mayor, I didn't go to a lot of movies. Sometimes I would get to the theater for the last scene, having promised Max I would be there on time this year time, but there were always all of these other things to do. And um, people would say, isn't it tedious going to all of those things? But I loved them because every time I was invited to come to something, it was about something that a group of Torontonians had done within their community to make something better. And as soon as the mayor came, they thought the mayor was important, and I guess at some level that's right. And if if I came and I was important, then they must be important too. And the work they were doing, the volunteering, the community building, was important. And all of those things for me were a way of connecting the people in all their diversity to, to the city. And uh, that was a way of, of connecting out there and really to leverage those things. And I used to think about it, if I can encourage one more person to pick up that piece of garbage or not rush, run the air and show that caring, listen to, converse with, understand, build. And some of the people I was encouraging to invest in millions of, of dollars. Other conversations or other roles for the mayor, one was in the region. I had, when uh, I was elected, my predecessor refused to have anything to do with the other mayors in the GTA, the Greater Toronto Area. I believe that it was essential for the mayor of Toronto to work with the other leaders in the greater Toronto area, the economic region of what we were a part. So one of the first things I did after being elected was call Mayor McCallion in Mississauga and invite her to come with the GTA mayors and have the first meeting at the Toronto City Council. And all of a sudden, the media started to pay attention to the GTA issues because it was downtown, the meetings were there, um, and the focus increased it, and uh, I was committed to that. 
The voice to the province. I never believed in a million years that fairly soon after my election, the province of Ontario would announce that they were planning to amalgamate the six cities in the region, in the, the first region in metropolitan Toronto into a single single uh, city and so I spent a lot of time working with citizen groups, working with the other mayors in, in Metro, uh, working hard to influence the province on that decision. Well clearly we weren't a lot of success, we weren't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of, of success in that but I certainly saw that as a role for me as mayor. And then a role in speaking for Toronto in the country, in, in Canada. I saw that as an important part of, of the role. And I know there are many ways where I've worked with my colleagues in cities and communities across the country on important issues. I worked hard on the, with the coalition on gun control to get the other big city mayors and the police chiefs from the big cities across the country to support uh, gun control and I think that coalition had a big piece to do with it. I know, because I still am told by many people how me marching in the Pride Parade the first year I was, was mayor, the first probably the first mayor in any community across this country who had done that, moved GLBT uh, equity issues forward. All of a sudden, it was a big issue in the national media, and then I did it, and the sky didn't fall, and opportunities started to emerge. People were empowered by that. And uh, th those are some of the things that being mayor can, can do. Healthy cities, housing, infrastructure, all of those things. I saw part of being mayor to speak out across the country on those issues to, to um, influence things. Finally, internationally. Uh, shortly after I was mayor, Fortune magazine, uh, called Toronto one of the best cities in 1996. It's all, every mayor loves that um, when it happens. You poo-poo it if it's uh, someone else's time or if it's negative, but if it says you, you are. Um, but I saw that as key for the economic activity in the, in the city, that if Toronto was seen as a good place to live, a safe and healthy, a creative city, a smart city, then the smart people would choose to come here. And in fact, the, the nature of work was changing so that smart people you, um, in a technological world more and more could choose where, where they came. And for a period, head offices, corporations chose to come here during, during that period. And I think some of that was because of the work that the mayor, in, in partnership with other councils and leveraging uh, corporations, design community artists, many groups across the city were able to contribute to that. So that's a bit about being mayor. Um, I said I was going to, um, to give you an example, but I'm not, because as you know, I talk slowly, and that's something that was always um, the bane of uh, people trying to get uh, short media clips was talking with me where they all be doing this throughout the interview. <laughs> hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And, and um, I still get uh, teased um, about that. But um, what 
they didn't realize was that half, maybe not quite half then, but a very large number of people in Toronto have English as a second language. And those people used to say to me all the time, Ah, oh, Barbara, the only one I understand. <laughs> so at that point, uh, I sort of relaxed. So you've heard some ramblings from a foreign, former mayor, a sort of being there kind of thing. The reason I love these, events like this is that I often end up being on panels with Sylvia, Sylvia Vyshevka, who really knows how cities work and, and what the, the relationship and role of people like mayors are. So I always love to come and hear her and learn and uh, now we're going to have a great opportunity Uh, both relative uh, to this city uh, and beyond it. 
Uh, if we look at some of the quantitative evidence, we know the size of Toronto uh, in the area where citizens are eligible to vote for the mayor is currently about uh, 2.6 million. Um, and it's important to recognize that while we have highly committed and high profile members of city council on um, various issues, and um, they may from time to time champion those issues or obstruct the mayor's agenda, no matter what mayor's in office, there really is no individual on council uh, or no faction on council that commands the at-large mandate from the uh, urban citizenry that's comparable to that of the mayor. Uh, moreover, uh, there's no at-large elected politician in this country who even approaches the magnitude of the at-large constituency in which uh, the Toronto mayor is, uh, is working. For example, um, if we look at the population of Montreal where the citizens are eligible to vote for the Montreal mayor, it's less than uh, 1.9 million. Population of Vancouver where the citizens are eligible to vote for that mayor is just over 600,000. Uh, Barbara mentioned there are more than 22 federal and provincial constituencies um, in the amalgamated city, uh, but the largest federal constituency in population terms uh, in this country is Brampton West. Uh, population there is about 170,000, and of course this is also Ontario's most populous riding. And so the point is there's no member of parliament who even approaches uh, the constituency in quantitative terms of the, uh, of the Toronto mayor's uh, constituency. Moreover, if we look at international quantitative evidence, um, we can see that the Toronto metropolitan area is holding about 15% of our country's population. And that's parallel roughly with London's proportion in the UK. And we all know that nobody ever questions the significance of London in the UK. And I won't enter into what people say about Toronto's significance in this country. Um, we also know, if we want to take the Toronto London comparison, that the GTA during recent decades has been the destination of choice uh, for about half the new immigrants to Canada. And that's parallel with London's importance as a destination of choice for immigrants to the UK. So once again, to amplify uh, Barbara's comments, we have uh, a mayor who's speaking for a particularly crucial um, segment of, uh, of new immigrants and new Canadians. Moreover, like London, uh, Toronto is characterized by a younger population than the rest of the country, by higher rates of paid employment among women, and by a more diverse population along many lines, which Barbara outlined, but I want to particularly pay attention to sexual orientation, uh, because that makes um, uh, the city, along with its uh, gender and age and immigration characteristics, uh, highly significant to really creating uh, our country and its uh, kind of multicultural international image. In empirical terms, then, the mayor of Toronto commands major national political significance as the leader of the country's largest city and by far the voice of the country's largest electorate. Moreover, the mayor of Toronto stands for crucial sources of social diversity along lines, including immigration, ethnocultural background, gender, sexual orientation, as well as age. And this is the case whether or not the individual who holds the position chooses to act on the demographic work reality. Um, now, if we want to imagine some uh, qualitative evidence, um, there is a rich vein of political research that um, suggests that individual public leaders matter. And they matter in municipal jurisdictions as much as at national and international levels. Um, and if we go back to the um, if we go back to the period um, immediately following amalgamation here in Toronto, um, and um, think about what was going on in uh, in the UK at the same time, uh, we saw um, the um, uh, opportunity to undertake research that was really quite different uh, from uh, what's normally available to social scientists. Uh, and here. The quantitative evidence that I've reviewed, I think, has a uh, very interesting uh, qualitative uh, dimension. Uh, because at the same time as we had amalgamation occurring here in the mid-90s, we had a renewal of local democracy in Britain's largest city. Uh, so this was the time I undertook a comparative study of women's civic engagement in Toronto and London. 
Now, um, we all remember Charles first amalgamated mayor uh, was Mel Lastman, uh, while the first leader of the new Greater London Authority was Ken Livingston. And uh, outside of Science Laboratory, it's very hard to imagine a starker contrast. As I said, social scientists really got this laboratory in the real world. Uh, so, my analysis that I reported in a, in a book called the Tales of Two Cities was published back in 2006. Um, I argued that there were significant differences in opportunities for women's representation that were directly attributable to differences in mayoral leadership. Um, they included, first, if we looked at Ken Livingston's uh, London, there were bureaucratic units that were designed to promote and deliver substantively on the policy concerns of specific groups in London, including women citizens. There was the absence of these sorts of units in Mel Lastman's Toronto. So in terms of qualitative evidence that's uh, somewhat different from the quantitative material, we can argue leaders clearly make a difference to the way citizens are represented in their cities. Moreover, the attention paid to issues including women's employment, housing, childcare, and transportation priorities in the municipal planning discussions in Greater London and the official planning documents in Greater London during the Livingston era, compared with the absence of any such attention in post-amalgamation Toronto. Now, of course, a visitor coming in from another planet could interject at this point to say that the differences between Ken Livingston's London and Mel Aston's Toronto had to do with more than simply individuals. And I would say yes, that's certainly true. Uh, so we can turn to some of the institutional factors that shape what being mayor of Toronto means in a post-amalgamation era. And therefore, I'll propose um, a more structural argument, which is uh, that the mayor of Toronto is highly constrained in fiscal and jurisdictional um, and electoral terms. Um, and I want uh, here to focus in particular on some of um, the political constraints, because We've seen a lot of discussion of economic limits facing Toronto in the wake of amalgamation and downloading. But if we think about political constraints, one of the most crucial, obviously, is that um, municipalities are not a constitutional order of government in Canada. In Ontario, we know from the Harris years, cities can be treated as pawns by the provincial government. This has occurred in living memory. Um, and that there are additional limits uh, that are imposed by the representational concepts that underpin parliamentary democracy in Canada. And I would argue these political constraints apply to mayors across the ideological spectrum. And they apply to all mayors in this country. I would argue that the concepts that underpin our parliamentary democracy allocate profound weight to land and trees and rocks, but they attribute considerably less importance to people. And for years, of course, I taught intro to Canadian politics, and I dubbed this the Group of Seven Approach to Political Representation, with no um, insult intended to our talented um, artists in this country. Uh, but it does, I think, help to explain how urban voters continue to be massively underrepresented in our federal as well as our provincial legislatures. I noted earlier that the population of Brampton West back in 2006 um, was uh, in the range of about uh, 170,000. Now, if you look at Prince Edward Island, yeah, nothing, nothing gets beyond. But the population, and people say this is during the height of the summer tour season, but anyway, that is about 140,000. And it has four seats in the House of Commons. So all of PEI has about 30,000 fewer people than Brampton West. So one of the arguments here is that urban Canadians are facing a, uh, a huge deficit in terms of political representation, and that affects all of our urban leaders across the country. We know an additional uh, political constraint on Toronto mayors comes from city council. And this is, this is true under uh, the uh, pre-amalgamation as well as post-amalgamation schemes. Um, city council here wields far more clout, for example, uh, than the Greater London Assembly uh, that um, is more of a kind of a adjunct uh, to the Mayor of London. Now a fourth set of limits, I would argue, involves the electoral dynamics of the Toronto mayoralty. 
And in particular, I want to pay attention to the ideological constraints on who can become mayor in the megacity era. Uh, if we focus on the question of left-right origins, we can take a look at the list of city of Toronto mayors, uh, which is in front of us. We're seeing who led um, downtown city government, roughly in the uh, quarter century before amalgamation, roughly 1970 uh, through 1996. If we compare those results with the results of amalgamated mayoral races since 1997, and here I'll switch to the amalgamated uh, mayors, um, I want to suggest three propositions that follow from a comparison of the old city of Toronto versus the amalgamated mayoral results. First, let me propose no city of Toronto mayor in the period since 1970, that was under the old city of Toronto system, was as right wing as Rob Ford, our current amalgamated mayor. And I'll present again a list of city of Toronto mayors since 1970. Second, I want to propose no amalgamated mayor today has been as progressive as either John Sewell or Barbara Hall, both of whom won mayoral office in the old city of Toronto. And third, I would propose that unless a major collective urban mobilization unfolds in Toronto, no amalgamated mayor is likely to be as progressive as John Sewell of Arbor Hall. So there are specific electoral patterns that underpin these arguments, many of which were clear in the results of the first megacity mayoral election of 1997. That year, we know Mel Lastman carried about 52% of the popular vote and defeated my distinguished panel panelist, Bart Hall, who won 46%. Now, the outcome of that race was closely related to a second dynamic that involves urban-suburban parameters as they interact with ideological ones. We know that voter turnout in the inner city wards of Toronto, with higher numbers of mobile citizens, notably tenants and transient housing, tends to be lower than in the inner city suburbs that form the core bases for Mel Lastman and more recently for Rob Ford. So turnout levels are correlated with residential stability, usually, um, where more voters or homeowners year after year in the same area, we tend to find higher rates of turnout. This tends to favor candidates of the center right and farther right over those of the center left and farther left. This is not a phenomenon that's unique to Toronto. Now we also need to be cognizant of a third factor, which is within ward variations, which are fascinating. I mean, if we look at the mix of single family houses and high rise buildings in a single ward, uh, we find that in Toronto in 2010, inside the same ward in the amalgamated Toronto, turnout could range from under 20% in one polling station to more than 78% in another. This is all within one ward. This suggests that the overall citywide turnout level, which was 53% in 2010, may not be all that meaningful because we have vastly divergent turnout levels in a single ward. Now, City of Toronto election statistics are available on the web and they make for fascinating reading. And I urge, um, I urge everyone here to have a look at them if you're interested in trying to make change at City Hall. Now these observations lead to a third proposition, uh, which is that for progressive interests, um, mobilizing, sorry, I'll go back to the uh, initial uh, slide. For progressive interests, mobilizing urban citizens is crucial to pushing back against the political constraints facing the Toronto mayor to realize the full potential of the mayoral position. We know from decades of cross-national research on urban politics that the most consistently engaged groups in an economically dynamic local scene, such as we find in contemporary Toronto, are commercial interests. They're notably property developers and financial interests who are tied with the property development uh, industry. And here I'm referring to examples of work by Susan Feinstein um, and, and other, uh, other scholars in the field. Their work shows that commercial interests work day by day, week by week, and year after year to maximize their economic returns, both current and future. As a result, the priorities of the public more generally, and particularly the sorts of policies that matter to youth and working women, 
and sexual orientation minorities and immigrants who form crucially distinctive components of the urban population, these priorities tend to fall by the wayside because the most motivated and mobilized segment of the urban population comprehends these groups as market niches and not as citizens of a democratic polity. So we might ask, what changes could raise the stature of broader public considerations on the municipal agenda and bring them right to the mayor's office? Well, again, we have the benefit of comparative research, which demonstrates that mayors and members of city council can insist on a wider set of social and not simply uh, commercial considerations in urban decision making, despite the human cry that comes from critics of looking at a broader definition of citizens and the urban polity. I'll conclude with a brief example. Uh, in London, during the Livingston years, the recognition that women working for pay were on average far more dependent on public transportation than their male counterparts underpinned a promise in the official plan of 2002 in London to build two new cross-city rail lines to increase bus capacity by 40% and to impose a congestion charge on cars entering inner London. In part, the mayor argued, this was to pay for the infrastructure investments and to open up space for more buses to help serve women in London. So 10 years later, here we are in Toronto, I have yet to hear an official voice at the mayoral level or in the planning realm speak to transportation as a matter of basic fairness for more than half the city's population, namely women, vast numbers of whom are working for a living. So I'll conclude here, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much.
citywide level. Um, if we look, for example, at um, at London uh, in the Livingston years, you could see that uh, property development interests were certainly very powerful, uh, but there was a countervailing force that said that property development had to serve more than uh, the um, developers, investors, um, and, and so on, and that. Um, Developments of a particular size would need to have, for example, childcare facilities included uh, in commercial, not just residential, uh, uh, development sites. Um, we saw the injection of um, emphasis on mixed housing uh, in, the, in the Docklands uh, area in that period. This was early in the development of East London that's become so, pop, you know, so popular now since the Olympics. But in the early days of Docklands development, it was a very controversial idea that you would sort of build developments where investment bankers would live near their um, uh, more junior employees or possibly near service workers and manual uh, laborers. Um, and Livingston's argument was that that was crucial to creating a healthy neighborhood, that uh, you needed, if you were going to have a city in the sense of people meeting and coming together and uh, sharing the neighborhood and a vision of, of a new area, in particular dock, the Docklands in its redeveloped form. Um, and so we saw that the, that the planning documents were very prescriptive um, in the sense that they did reflect a larger set of concerns about not just child care and mixed housing, but also the transportation infrastructure that would be available, um, the park, the <coughs> schools. I mean, it was much more about a larger social vision, and I think it did in part Come from the mayor, came from the uh, assembly. It also came from a highly engaged local media, who I think in the in the British case uh, have uh, have had a much longer term recognition of London's role as a jewel in the larger uh, crown, you know, called the UK. Um, why would I say that? I, I think historically, if you look, uh, I think the Central Line in London was built, you know, around the same time as University College in the 1850s. Um, they were, you know, the, the tracks were wide enough for horse-drawn carts in either direction, which is how London trains are the width they are now. Um, but the point is, the city has an understanding of itself as an urban community uh, for a very long time, and you can argue that Toronto has only recently started to gain that recognition. You know, you look at histories of Toronto, as I remind my students, Lawrence Avenue was a muddy road in the 1940s. So, uh, the whole notion that uh, there's a need to sort of think about London as the you know, urban hub of a, of a larger country, Toronto only surpassed Montreal in population size in the, in the 70s, and so we have had a much later realization of the role of the city, and in particular of the responsibility of Canadian media to pay attention to the city. So I, I think that there are many, um, many reasons why Mayors of London, including Livingston's successor, who's very different ideologically, but has not moved that far away from many of his priorities on livable neighborhoods, bicycles, the role of public transportation, and so on. Those have become um, an important part of the understanding of representing urban interests, broadly speaking. And uh, I think in Toronto, we probably have a great deal to learn. Um, from that example in terms of how, how to think about a larger city as it's defined in the interests of multiple interests. In other words, in London, we can see many claims and a great deal of commercial uh, investment and development, but we also see an emphasis on making that work for a broader, uh, a broader community. One of, the, one of the things missing from the Kings, which I think is a tragic loss opportunity, is really affordable housing as part of it. And we, uh, we believe that it would uh, include significant amounts of affordable housing in the way St. Lawrence, for example, uh, has, has a real mix. And um, during my time as, as mayor, the, the social housing programs were killed virtually. Mike Harris called me and canceled 23 uh, developments of affordable housing.
housing in the city of Toronto during during that period of, of time, many of which would have been in that area and would have created a, a mix. So that's one of the of the limitations of um, the jurisdiction of governments that the city really doesn't have the resources to fund that on itself. So absenting the provincial and federal government there wasn't the capacity to, to do that. What was the initial priorities from the budget's point of view? So Michael Harris took money away from you, took funding, but the priority of of uh, assisted housing was not high enough for it to bear a place on the budget. Well, I'm not sure that the property tax is the vehicle to to fund that. I think uh, I got into municipal politics because of um, the shortage of affordable housing, and I um, was involved with every affordable housing project for you know, 10 years as an advocate for often against uh, the local councillor. Um, but I, I don't believe that, uh, that local governments can fund uh, affordable housing. And, you know, that's why even in my present position, continue to advocate the federal and provincial government to have a national and a provincial housing strategy. Mayors have been working at that forever, I think, and groups like the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, um, those are, are key issues. And if you hear the, the mayors today talking about those major issues around crumbling infrastructure and the major uh, tragedies flowing from homelessness and what the, the, the people are there, but it's it's about organizing, it's about influence as opposed to 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 real power. And uh, sometimes there's there's progress, and sometimes uh, sometimes there there isn't. And in a time. Fiscal challenges. Nothing happens in this area. Uh, I would uh, propose that uh, whenever we have discussions in Canada about uh, redistricting, you know, the arguments that we need uh, we need to consider population growth in this part of the country and what is it going to do to seats and legislatures and so on. And every time we have this question of electoral reform on the agenda, we really need to hear from mayors because there is a hugely urban dimension to all these discussions, which I know many people gloss over and, and really uh, kind of uh, see as, a, as an insomnia cure to talk about redistricting and electoral reform, but they're hugely crucial for the ability of urban citizens to have voice in legislatures. You know, I talked about this group of seven approach to political representation, it's not just a joke. I mean, it's, it's the reality that's been with us as a country for a very long time. Um, and I think it also feeds into this question about resources for mayors. Because what we've seen in other jurisdictions is the willingness to talk about what the Brits call uh, hypothecated taxation, ring fencing. Uh, it's really all about asking people, okay, so we had a, G we had a reduction in the federal GSD at one point. But we didn't have the insertion of a question. So what if there were um, some tax imposed by one of the levels of government that is more able jurisdictionally to tax a federal or provincial government that was ring that was simply bounded and had to go towards urban housing, or bounded and had to go towards urban transportation? That's the case of the congestion charging in London. It can't just go towards who knows what. It has to go towards the creation of public transportation alternatives, which include opportunities for pedestrians, right? Because bicycles, pedestrians, buses, subways, trains, whatever, are all crucial parts of getting people on cars. 
um, even building lanes for taxi cabs. Um, it also moves far more people. Um, on average, you're, you're, you're seeing more people in cabs. So the um, uh, idea about experimenting with other forms of taxation, we know it's very risky for politicians who face election to talk about raising taxes. But I think that many Canadians are particularly living in cities are aware of the extent to which you can travel just about anywhere, for example, and find a train to the airport. It's not a theory. It actually exists. It's not a discussion topic for 35 years. It's here. I mean, unfortunately, the train to the airport is a bit like Senate reform. As a, <laughs> you know, as a political scientist, I know I can always speak about that in, in a Canadian politics course because everybody's heard the debates. It's gone on for so long. And you can argue that you know the absence of a train to the airport affects way more people's lives day to day than whether we have a Senate that's elected or how long their terms are and all the rest of that. So I would suggest that part of it is the mayoral leadership and uh, city council leadership that tries to insert that urban voice at every opportunity on every redistricting discussion, every electoral reform discussion, and every taxation uh, discussion. No, I just meant the case. Yeah. Okay, the larger GTA. <laughs> okay. And then the uh, amalgamated city and then the old city of Toronto. So there's really multiple categories here. I think we have to be careful about assuming that, for example, you know, Mayor X was elected because of, you know, some dynamic that, diff that distinguishes between both us and them. Uh, inner city versus, uh, you know, inner suburbs. I think we have to be very careful. I, I for example, live in um, what's federally and provincially St. Paul's uh, constituency. And you know, if you look at the wards uh, in that area along uh, along Young Street, you know, St. Clair, Davisville, and so on, you see that roughly a third of, of voters in 2010 voted for Rock Four and that part of the city. So I mean, I think it's very important to get away. Uh, from this kind of division about, you know, person X was foisted upon the citizens of whatever part of the city because of some other out there. I think it's very dangerous in a city. I think it's very corrosive of an urban fabric. So I, my point is really a more positive one. It's about paying attention, for example, to low rates of voter turnout in many urban wards in the city. Urban, I mean inner city, downtown wards. You can see within, as I said, within a single ward, a, a rate of uh, turnout under 20% and in the range of 80%. That's an enormous variation. You hardly ever see that uh, in uh, federal provincial elections. You, you tend to see somewhat less variation. So um, I think part of this question about for progressive interests that want to see other types of mayors elected, a, a lot of the responsibility rests with uh, getting municipal politics to matter to enough citizens of a progressive uh, variety who are then prepared to actually not just go to the polls and vote, but actually work for candidates and, and put forward uh, ideas for candidates and, and just really try to regenerate um, municipal politics. Because you know historically, our turnout levels at the local and municipal levels in Canada have been in the 30 to 35 percent range. The last municipal election had a remarkably high turnout, which is encouraging. But the point is that that high turnout masks pockets of the city where turnout, you know, 20% is quite dangerous from the perspective of not just democratic theory, but democratic practice. It's really speaking about the extent to which, in particular, we're integrating and making politically um, meaningful uh, our, our, our urban government to all the citizens uh, who are eligible to vote in the city. There's also a question of whether people who aren't citizens should be able to vote in, in city elections, which has been tried in many cities of the world that have uh, immigrant populations like Toronto, and that's another possibility to talk about engaging people before they actually become citizens, so that when they are citizens, they're, they're, uh, they have um, experience exercising the right to vote. Well, I, I mentioned uh, my friend Tom becoming chair of a of budget, which would not have been something um, I supported, and yet, um, I was able to find a way to to work around that and to most frequently um, have things that uh, needed needed money get supported even if um, the chair wasn't wasn't supportive. I think um, clearly in a 
larger city, and I haven't been there to experience that. Uh, in order to make things happen, I think the mayor needs more, more power to to make that happen. I think um, there. I think the in but in all of the uh, all of the government since amalgamation, I think. Uh, the mayor at some point anyway, starting out, has had control of a majority of the votes on, on the council. So in that case, it, it, didn't really, uh, it doesn't really matter. We go back to the old Metro Council and the boroughs. Or we look in the Thatcher years at the old Greater London Council and the boroughs. All of that, um, multiple jurisdictional scenario was a very, very helpful target for right-wing government. Uh, Thatcher, we know, shut down the Greater London Council, and we know about Mike Harris and uh, Metro and the boroughs and the creation of the, the uh, amalgamated megacity. So the, the notion about waste and duplication, I think, is, 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 is a very powerful one, and I don't see us going to a two-tiered uh, a municipal uh, uh, and local system anytime soon. But what I do think is that Barbara's point about community councils is hugely important. It's really where do citizens feel they're being, uh, uh, you know, that they're able to have a voice. And as uh, Richard pointed out, if 73,000 is the average ward population under amalgamation, you know, there are a lot of people who don't feel terribly well served under these wards with so many people. You know, it's not the intimate level of government that the textbooks say it is when you're one of 73,000 people in the war. So I think that there's a, a lot of dissertation research and uh, master's and undergraduate research opportunities to look at the community councils uh, under amalgamation and see the extent to which they are or are not effective because many activists who work on um, issues politics at the municipal level are quite frustrated and maintain that the community councils may have been more uh, window dressing to sort of argue that there would be citizen voice um, and that, uh, that they have not at all recreated the sense of cohesion that existed under the old borough system. And so the citizen belonging, which is very important, I want to emphasize, the international research shows that when immigrants come into a large city, they, uh, they belong, like the people who live there for generations often belong to a geographical area. And when you don't have a sense that there's a voice for your area because you're in such a large conglomeration and it doesn't have a whole lot of traction uh, at the political level, then that leads to all kinds of other difficulties at, quote, senior levels of government, which in Canada are the ones with the constitutional power to run cities. So I would emphasize that it's, it's really about making the most grassroots level work, and the community council experiment may not be such um, an optimistic story. Just as well as going to larger areas, community councils that may or may not be effective, a lot of the advisory committees, the citizen committees that used to exist uh, in, in more in the, the former city of Toronto have been abolished. So everything's been rolled into to one. I always thought those groups gave incredibly uh, high value expertise and information in to to the city. You know, if you look at the Humber and the Dawn and all the freeing up of, of acres and acres of recreational space, the force and a lot of the work behind that was done by citizens with the passion for cleaning up those rivers and, and liberating them for people. And mass, you know, thousands of families down there and young people and all ages of people using them and loving them 
with almost nothing in terms of dollars going into the, the production of them. And in so many areas, that's, that's what happens. People, so many groups have a passion for, for where they live, for their city, and are prepared to put a lot of time and expertise into it. And, you know, Jane Jacobs at all did that around the, the Kings, and I think we benefited massively from it. So you want to make those things happen and, and leverage them, not shut them down. And I hope that you'll bring your questions and your enthusiasm to our next session, uh, which will be October 29th, and we'll be talking about Toronto City Council. I do really want to thank you, uh, Barbara Hall and Sylvia Bashevkin, for sharing your rich insights and your knowledge on the practice of what it's like to be there, on policy issues, on the challenges, and on the many successes that a mayor uh, of a city like Toronto and other cities can achieve. And I think tonight we got to start to talk about some of the constraints that the mayor feels, both at a uh, sort of at a more senior level of um, federal and provincial politics as well as the constraints within the city in terms of representation uh, and in terms of the sort of power versus powerlessness with a new 44-member council. So thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you all on uh, 